Hey, everyone. Can everybody hear me? Yep. Okay. Yes. Yep. yep. All right. So I know Karen, it looks like, is installing updates, but I see the rest of the the uh, Commit to the Bits team. Do you all want to wait for her? Yeah, I think she should be back in a few seconds. Yeah. She's just like, her computer is just booting up again. Oh, you got a lot of technology. All right, while we're waiting for Karen, just wanted to welcome everybody to our first ever Zoom round of final presentations. I think everybody's getting on line as we speak. Um, just, just a couple little uh, um, bits of etiquette and process for us. Uh, what we'll do, if you're not the team presenting, if you could just mute yourself and turn off your video, that'd be great to help, just to help with um, the bandwidth as we start getting you know, dozens of people here, that'd be great to help the team have, a, and that actually focuses the, the presentation on them when it's on the stream as well. So that's very helpful. Um, so if everybody can please mute themselves, turn off their video, that'd be great. Um, Dave's really doing a great job working the, the um, waiting room. We're just letting people in, we're just using it as one extra round of security to help make sure nobody Zoom bombs your finals. Um, unless that's what commit to the bit wants, because they're all about that improv. Um, and Karen's left them hanging. Uh, so what we'll do is he's doing that. I'm gonna help uh, just so for producers of the team, I'll use the chat just to say like 10 minutes, five minutes, you know, and we'll get into Q and A. Um, Dave will also be doing that in terms of Q and A. I'm sorry, Tom's the one who's doing the waiting room. Dave's gonna help monitor the Q and A if you can just let us uh, know he'll call on you and then you can unmute yourself if you want to turn the video on to ask the question. We're all here for you all to ask questions. Um, and Steve's gonna be a bit of a, uh, if people accidentally leave their mics on or turn their cameras on, Steve will turn them off um, just to help with the bandwidth for the presenting team. How does that sound for everyone? Go ahead. I like it that for, for right now, Shiva is just the one who's up in my speaker screen. For whatever reason, <laughs> he's the focus. Um, so we're recording these, so we'll have them just for posterity for all the fun. Um, as you all get ready to go, once we get Karen back, did she get back? I don't see her yet. No Karen yet. Not here. All right, we'll give her like another couple minutes. Um, and then we'll get started with them. Does that sound good for everybody? And we're letting teams in and then, you know, once you all are done, I'll, tr I'll help try to moderate through, you know, we'll get you all done, turn your mics and screens off and get uh, the next team up and running right behind you. The other side will go behind you. The mod theater dot exe career 2040 co VR and Neo security have a nice full day of presentations. <clears throat> and, and if you're, be, Oh, go ahead. I'm going to just be clear about questions. I think, uh, if everyone's comfortable with chat, what we can do is just sort of like, um, people have questions, just like type in, like if they have a question, so just like question. And then we will, I'll call on you and we'll unmute and do that as a way to just sort of like be clear before we're sort of chatting about, which is unmuting, but I think just type into chat um, when we get to the question space that you have a question and then we'll use that to sort of call and mute and do voice to voice at that point. That sounds great. And it looks like Karen's still delaying. Oh, she's here, I think. Oh, there she is. Hey, sorry. Oh, I am so sorry. Okay. Uh, okay, wait. So how do I how do I share the slides with all of you? You can either be the one sharing, or you can have someone. If you have the slides, and you just go down to the bottom and says share screen. Uh, it says share screen has been disabled by host. I got it. Yeah, sorry, I don't have the back, same background as everybody. But... At least your computer's back up and running. Hey, what was that? At least your computer's up and running. <laughs> I know, that's important. 
Yeah, it says screen sharing has been disabled, so I am not able to share from my screen right now. I'm looking for it. Where the heck? Go ahead and try again. Yeah, try, try again. again. Today, I just opened it to all participants. Okay. No, oh, yeah. Participants. Okay. All right. Awesome. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Okay. Wait. Yeah. Sorry, not very familiar with this one. Right. Okay. Um, should Are we... you ready? Okay. I am ready whenever. Okay, should we start? Hello everyone. We are team Commit to the Bits and we are a discovery project trying to incorporate the rhythm of a full impro show on Twitch. Our advisors are Jessica and Brenda and this is our team. Today we are going to talk about our definition of success, show production toolkit. We created uh, multiple play testings and the insights. We help improvisers to run a smooth improv show on live streaming platform Twitch by delivering a show production toolkit, which will allow them to communicate to the audience with the built-in interaction system and collaborate with other actors remotely. We had to make some pivots after halves and we needed to design solution for video call setting. By doing that, we discovered new relevance of improv show on Twitch during the quarantine and validated the needs of a technical solution for a live show by contacting yeah. the improv groups who were trying to run a smooth improv show on Twitch. That said, our metric of success remains the same. Running smooth improv show on Twitch, having the audience interaction, and building a Twitch improv community. We validated these by handling the technical difficulties for running a smooth improv show and audience interaction using our show production toolkit. Our final deliverables are the weekly improv shows using our show production toolkit and the documentation. Now we are going to talk about our show production toolkit. In our current setup, we have actors and host or streamer on a Skype video call. Host controls the streaming software Streamlabs mm -hmm. and the toolkit we have created. Before COVID, we had a stage manager who controlled some part of the toolkit. Audio video input such as the Skype calls video feed for each actor is added to the Streamlabs and the suggestion input chatbot overlay is triggered from the two. The final output comes from the Streamlabs, which the audience sees on the Twitch. Now Shiva will cover in detail about the show production token. Thanks, Amkant. Okay, so we started by identifying all the functions that would be needed for running a high production quality show on Twitch and search for tools that could already support this by default. This is where our toolkit feature set started evolving as we couldn't find one single tool that does all the functions listed under this toolkit. Uh, so we then started to search for frameworks that could support such functions and fixed on Twitch Lib Unity, an API that gave us control both to listen to and post to Twitch chat from a Unity application. This then became the framework around which we uh, built everything. Uh, the design came down to two major components. One, the server, which interfaces with Twitch directly for both bot posting and chat listening and the client, which is fed into Streamlabs as a window with green keyed out to make it a uh, transparent overlay for the screen. Uh, so why Skype, you might ask, especially during the Zoom times. So we ran through all available video call options and discovered that Skype had this extra functionality to export each video feed in the video call to this low level stream NDI, which could then be sourced inside Streamlabs directly. This also gave us the ability to control and place each of the video call feeds wherever we wanted on the screen which was important for mixing up the look of the games. Uh, so coming to the actual toolkit functionalities, the first, uh, oh, sorry, uh, a scene in, uh, just before that, the scene in Labs is analogous to like an empty canvas, but in this case, it allows you to composite different kinds of audio and video media streams. Uh, this served as an easy way for us to set up each game and its audio and visual elements uh, for the show and also control their levels in real time during the stream. So I, again, coming back to the actual toolkit functionalities, 
the first thing we wrote was a chatbot for the toolkit through the API. The problem with the first explaining the rules of the game and the suggestion mechanisms verbally was that if someone missed hearing it, uh, they wouldn't be able to suggest or immediately understand what is happening in the scene. Uh, hence, we this chatbot was used to make the information about the suggestion and the game description more permanent by making it making the bot post about it on the chat and also use the same system to remind the audience how they could suggest during the course of the game. Uh, we then got to a point of testing out multiple games in different shows. We needed a smoother way to fill this game description and suggestion mechanisms for the bot. So it was becoming a difficult task for the host to uh, type out everything during the middle of the show. And uh, hence, we created a JSON-based text solution for putting all the game details before in hand, uh, uh, before the show, and bring it up as like template buttons, which would just autofill these fields uh, during the show. And this JSON file also eventually served as a nice repository of games for us to keep track of. Uh, one important design decision was to have the ability to pick and show suggestions on the stream, since it uh, helped give context to the game and also was a good feedback mechanism in terms of making the audience feel like they were part of the show when the suggestion was picked. So we created a window which fills up uh, comments from the chat and has a filtering mechanism for the host to select the suggestion, and it would automatically push it to the client for it to appear on the overlay for the stream. Uh, I'll now pass it over to Guimin for talking about more of the visual components of the toolkit. Um, well, thank you, Shriya. And now I will introduce the choosing presidential function. So for some of the game, like the story conductor, we need a visual and audio element to indicate who should be speaking when. So we build this function to support this. And the host will <laughs> click one of the bottom and choose who will present next. And after the host collects, the dialog bubble will show in the chosen position and the bell sound will be played to remind the actors that the presenter has been changed. And our toolkit also provided the hot case for visual effect and sound effect. And to make our show lively, the host and stage manager will use this function to trigger some effect like the love try to right. the end of game sense effect at the right time. So for the audience, they want to participate in our show and show their feedback in the real time. So we designed this audience reaction overlay. We use the Twitch chat package to read the commentary in the real time. And if the audience send keywords like ha ha or yeah, some animated GIF image will be played at the top left corner as a feedback. And now let me introduce our artwork to support the show and toolkit. We took inspiration from the theater and stage settings, and so we improved the cartoon animation and add a brick wall background for our show. So for the games, we try to avoid to having our show looks like a boring conference call. So we use this cartoon style image as an overlay to make our show more engaging and keep the design simple and flexible to support different kinds of suggestions. And during the games, as we mentioned, we designed those GIF image that can be triggered by the audience comment, and those will be played as a video in the Unity application. As we previously mentioned, there are video and audio effect that could be triggered by the hockey through the toolkit. Also, we have created some ambience for yeah. most of the game that were sources through the stream app. And here's a video to show how the toolkit works. Okay, um, it seems that the video I'm able to play, but we will send a link to the chat area. And now, Karin will talk about our weekly improv show. Thanks, Guimin. Now I'm going to talk about the weekly improv shows that we have been running. We have run a total of four full improv shows on Twitch after halves. We have played 22 improv games across. We have had um, three professional actors, uh, three student improvisers and two student host streamers participate. What a total audience member of um, 120, which averages to 30 viewers per show. We used about 2.5 suggestions per game across the shows. In designing the structure of the show, based on seasoned improviser's opinion and our experience, we found that starting with a warm-up game, then going to then going into the show, alternating between games and scenes, then ending the show with everyone on stage made the most sense and seemed to have kept the audience engaged. Our design has gone through a couple of iterations. We did our first show post pivot on April 6, intending to validate our setup with Skype, Streamlabs, as well as the functionalities of our toolkit. 
Through the show, we learned that having a properly structured show is very important. Allah mentioned the show is dry visibly and audibly. In an attempt to address some of the issues raised, for this playtest, we worked on cutout images as well as various transition elements. This time, we learned that we need to manage our lag time better. We also learned that we should make cutout images more relevant in general for each game. So for the next show, we worked on creating audio effects that could be triggered by host and visual effects that could um, trigger by the content in chat. We also added a chat box overlay that the actors can host and the host can read and banter with to fill the lag time. We made sure rehearsal time is in place to clear up the game rules as well as tech issues. We learned that the laugh track is not going to work for everyone, but it works well enough. The host bantering with improvisers makes audience feel more connected to the cast. We wanted to see if someone external to the project could use our toolkit to host a show. So for the most recent playtest, we had an external host. Aside from that, we also added in new games as well as some background music. We've learned that while it's manageable to learn the functionality of our toolkit, multitasking as a host is hard, so streamlining the process is extremely important. Now I'm going to cover briefly on some feedback we have received. First, over 75% of people felt the overall experience of watching the show is satisfying other than, rather than disappointing, and the show went smoothly. 85% of the people had a clear idea of what's going on at all times during the show. All audience who participated in the survey suggested ideas through the chat and felt satisfied. 78% of people felt that the chatbot communicated how to make suggestions and game descriptions clearly. This survey shows that our toolkit helps people understand the show mechanism effectively. In terms of our improv games, many people enjoyed exaggeration type games the most. Some people felt that story games were less enjoyable because the game are longer and require more of an attention span. Based on this data, we tried to maintain a good balance between different types of games. And now I'm going to hand it over to Hyo Wen, who is going to talk about the interviews that she had with improvisers and hosts. Thanks, Karen. Let's talk through it briefly. Um, all actors agree that it was an enjoyable experience, but for the host, it was quite a nervous experience because the show's rhythm depended on the host. Regarding a learning curve, most of the actors didn't have many problems getting used to this new setup. But for the host, they needed to learn how to control several applications, and it took at least a week to master all the functionality. In terms of what they liked the most about this project, actors said it was a good opportunity to improvise during the lockdown, and they liked the digital show production elements. In case of hosts, they like a traditional way to send them work. We also asked them, what did you like the least? I just pointed out communication issue on online setting. Hosts had trouble to have too many things to do. When the new technology works smoother than expected, actors and hosts felt surprised the most. And in the same way, when you have technical difficulties, they felt frustration. During the show, actors just wanted to see the Twitch window, not the host window. And for the host, they wish to have a simple UI for the toolkit and more automatic function. Lastly, I will recap our discoveries. We have key takeaways from audience, show elements, and toolkit. Audiences tend to be motivated to suggest because they wanted to be part of the show and steer conversation. Features, sound effects, and interaction increases a virtual sense of being together with actors. However, audiences wanted more control and freedom to interact with the show in real time. Many audiences commented that they want a they want to control real-time left and clap down to deliver their reaction to actors, which is not available on our current system because of the lag. Next, we needed to solve the major lag issues for a smooth running show. Still, there is a technical limitation from Twitch site, so we decided to add short bantering time with actors as a show element. We found that moderate lag issues could usually be solved by this. We also discovered the virtual eye contact worked very well, even though the audience knew that this setting is virtual. We also could utilize multiple layers of uh, media sources with simple control, and it helped to feel the lack of crowd feel and lack of social presence a lot. However, we faced diff difficulties in video call setting. Actors and hosts had trouble communicating with each other at the right timing. Overlapping or awkward silence moments often happened during the show, which could interrupt the show flow. Also, face cutout image has a limitation that blocks actors' body gesture and acting. Next, in terms of the toolkit, suggestion overlay effect and automatic chatbot system work well with Twitch's drop-in, drop-out nature by providing the context to the audiences. However, the underlying problem of this toolkit is that it, it requires heavy overload to host streaming during the live show. If we had more time, we could separate the toolkit to two control panels, one for the host 
platform for the state managers. So the host do not have to manage a ton of things while hosting. And this is our last slide. We would like to thank you everyone who supported our project. Thank you for your time today. And we're taking questions. Did you do any iteration on the uh, host screen? Um, there are um, several different iter. Uh, the question was, um, did we do any iteration on the host screen? Um, did you mean like kind of like the Streamlab setting and the toolkits and um, the stuff that will be appearing on the host screen? Um, uh, the, the setup, the setup for all of the things that you showed at the beginning. Um, sure. So the toolkit has kind of um, evolved over time. We added in more functionalities as we went. Um, so yeah, so there are definitely changes that happened um, with the host screen. If that Does that answer your question? Um, partially, I think partially. Um, I was thinking more for usability purposes, like to test that, mm -hmm. that, you know, the buttons are in the right place and that it, you know. Right. I, I could take that question. So uh, the point of uh, the toolkit was to see what all functionalities was necessary to make the uh, host uh, or for the host to make, uh, make it easier to run the show. So uh, we kept uh, adding a lot of functionalities, but uh, over time, like the UI stuff wasn't our primary, uh, uh, primary priority. Uh, the functionality was uh, primary. So we made it as functional as possible, but then definitely the UI uh, can go through a lot of iterations to make it look, look a little more better uh, in terms of usability, if that's what you're asking. The usability became better over time as some of the stuff were um, animated. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. I think uh, Mike has a question. Yeah, I, I like your comments about the cutout images. And I liked the way you saw that when the actors would look at each other, that was really a, a powerful moment. Uh, could you talk a little bit about how you evolved the cartoon cutout imagery to make support more of those powerful actor moments? Um, okay, so the question was how um, through the how we evolved the cutout images that we have in our show, as well as how the moments between actors eye contact has evolved during the show. Is that correct? And and how you you try to make the art uh, propel those those good acting moments even higher. Um, is there? Yeah, I can, I can. So uh, I think the the first first iteration when we added these cutout elements was to make, uh, firstly, just make the screen a little more lively instead of just having like a video conference setting. But then uh, throughout the other playtests, uh, without even us telling the actors, they started making eye contact. So we actually started making the, uh, uh, the area that the actors are in a little more big and give, give them a little more uh, space in the, in that within within that small cutout for them to uh, use their hands and stuff a little more, even though like the body and all that is already done in the uh, done in the background. So uh, towards the end of like towards the end of last show, the actors uh, they were saying how uh, little more bloated up cut uh, cutouts where they're seen more gave them the ability to use their whole body rather than just like the face and. Uh, to to enhance like the uh, whatever whatever acting that they were doing. So I think uh, gradually we increase the design of those cutouts, but then uh, there is still some room for improvement in terms of having them uh, being able to emote as much as they could. Okay, that's time for commit to the bits. Congratulations, team. Good job. Yay. All right, so if you all can mute yourself and turn off your video and we'll get ready for next up. See, other side out there, I mean, it's, who's next? Other side, right? Yeah, the other side out there and ready to go? Oh man, are they ever. Um, my video is stopped by the host. Oh. Who? 
Ruchi? Yeah. You can start it now. Try it. Yeah. All right, whenever y'all are ready. So hi, we are the other side and this is our team and our instructors, Shirley and John. For today, we'll introduce the project and have a quick demo on our final product. Then we'll follow this agenda to go through our progress of development. We, uh, the other side has been working with our client, Stefan Casper, an assistant teaching professor at CMU. And he is also the director of the Aswith Kenner Global languages and cultures room. Our client wanted us to design the experience of the room that it would engage more people to come and learn about languages and cultures. Our goal is to create an engaging experience it was specifically for this kind of room and we wanted it to grab people's attention to raise awareness of what this room has to offer. It will communicate the idea of the room which is about cultures, languages and identity. Then eventually it will attract more visitors to engage with this room. Our solution is to create um, is to turn this regular glass wall into an interactive projected screen. We don't have access to the room at the moment, so we will use VR simulation to present what it will look like. Now let's take a look at what the other side has created for the room. What we created was essentially a polling system. It'll engage the visitors to express what they think and that they can see their personal opinion transformed into public art. The experience will take place in the hallway, where it is directly open to the public traffic. It is designed to be simple and easy to engage. Visually, we created several projection areas to divide the question and options. The circular shapes are welcoming and adaptable to various projected contents and design. The colors and shapes are meant to be neutral and inclusive, which do not represent any specific cultures. The interactive glass is built using rear projection film, which will be installed onto the glass. It will turn the transparent glass into a projectable screen. Fidget light sensors are attached onto the inner side of the glass to detect touch input on the outside surface. The sensors will be held in place on the glass using 3D printed containers. The container sensors are adjustable for future replacement and maintenance. While in the idle state, animation was designed to attract people to come to interact with it. When visitors walk up to the glass wall, they could easily engage by putting their hand on the glass to select and see the response. The whole interactive experience is intuitive and almost effortless. The system craze a digital learning environment that was provided as a tool for the student to play with. It was set to inspire students to explore the possibilities of content. We worked with the client to come up with three templates. Each serves different purposes and demonstrate unique functionalities and mechanics. As we were building a completely new system, the templates were necessary and helpful for both users and developers. The users can edit the content through an editor. The showcase template was designed for promoting projects and events, besides a question or a statement. Users can also upload an image or a video to the meme bubble. It not only introduces the activities to the public, but also invites people to react to it. For each template, users can also choose from a list of saved contents. The green dot indicates which content is currently active on the glass wall display. The pooling template was designed for students to express opinions to academic topics or trending news using the abstract tokens. The conversation template was looking to get closer to the students. It creates a sense of opening up new conversations and a change of perspective when offering their opinions. Our solution was to transform the face of the canner room to establish a sharing space. The pooling system can lead to a public conversation and raise awareness of cultures, languages, and identities. So following what was shown in the video, we will deliver an editor and a Unity application for the display to run the whole system. As for the hardware, we will deliver to the client the circular film screen and the sensors with a comprehensive manual and documentation. 
As a delivery project, the other side has gone through research several pitch designs to discuss with the client and prototyping on the technology to realize the design. After a half, we had to adapt to the remote working. We pivot to build a VR simulation of the location to help us move forward to the final implementation and iterations. Last but not least, we've had seven playtests throughout the semester, and now Lou would be digging into how playtests have helped us. Thank you, Annie. Uh, we built this product specifically for the Canon route, our target audience, who was identified as passerbys as the students. As you can see, there are four playtests we conducted before the half. The half has shaped our concept into the final design by defining our design medium, determining the pooling system mechanism, and testing the content we want to display. However, after the half, due to the quarantine policy and no access to the Canon route, we had to pivot our testing plan and created a VR simulation of the environment to communicate and test our design. Why do we need VR? The first is visioning our design in 3D environment. Although we are designing on a 2D glass interface, our project will be displayed in a 3D environment, which means that we should consider our design from the spatial perspective. The VR system can help us tell how different templates look from different viewpoints. The second, simulate people's interaction with the installation. With the headset on, people can not only have the feeling of the actual size of the installation, but also experience the physical interaction with it. Like they can reach out with their hands to touch the sensor, which is beneficial for us to understand the user's behavior. The third, communicate our design. We use VR to put our design in the simulated scenario, which is much easier for our playtester and clients to understand our location-based project and give us more feedback to push our design forward. However, we know that there are some limitations in VR, like the perspective limitation or the light intensity difference. So VR just serves as the tool to visualize our design and test the function of different templates. Besides the VR build, we also provided the 2D interactive build from the front view of the glass to reach out to more PC play tester. And we designed a survey to focus on collecting more in-depth feedback about the interaction design and visual design. And we got 40 testers in total to test our design. Then we analyzed the feedback and corresponded them into each stage of user experience and concluded four goals that get our design iteration. Let's start with the conversation template. You can see we changed the main bubble layout to scroll the next message in to make the message fit the circular shape well. And in order to enhance the contrast, we added the shadow behind each text bubble. Besides, we added a heartbeat effect in each option bubble and the ripple animation behind the sensor to define the touching area. And you can see when you put your hand on the sensor, the message will be filled and sent to the main bubble. And what you send will trigger the message about how many people select the same option to show up. The second is the showcase template. Besides the moving web animation, we used the vivid color palette to draw people's attention. And we added a jumping arrow above the sensor to let people know where to touch. As the video shows, when you press the sensor, the touching arrow is built and becomes the drop, then falling to the water to raise the water level. And then the data will show up at the position of the option, which makes the number obvious to people and also give the meaning of it. Next is the pooling system template. We designed the blink animation to draw people's attention and tell people where the touching area is. The token is designed to have different shapes with different colors and size. And you can see we added a little icon at the top of small bubble to correspond to each option. As the video shows, when you trigger the sensor, the token is launched from the touching area and fly, flies to the corresponding option bubble. And then the data will change at the little icon inside the bubble. Next, Ningxiang will talk about our matrix. All right, thank you, Lu. So earlier in this master, we have defined our matrices of success as client requirements, interactivity, and prototyping. As per client requirements, we were to design an installation that will attract public attention to this room while featuring cultures and languages. Thus, we transform the face of the room, the glass wall, to an interactive screen. Our system allows the clients and students to keep the display dynamic. The abstract visual design is meant to be inclusive for all cultures. And the second matrix is interactivity, targeting the people walking by the glass wall. The touch interaction on the surface is designed to be intuitive and short, so it's easy to comprehend and play with. 
We provide these three templates, each with unique visuals and two sensor layout with the flexibility of adding or removing touch points in the settings. And the last one is prototyping. Prototypes help us in delivering the product with full functionalities. We use them for integrating our visual interaction and system design. After the quarantine, we continue sending out weekly build in both PC and VR. These prototypes, along with the VR simulation, were very effective in communicating with clients and faculties on our deliverables. We received a lot of helpful feedback from playtesting and soft opening and had a discussion after with our client about the concerns and how we could address them. The first concern is whether the design was att attractive enough for passerby in the idle state. To address that, for the conversation template, we integrated the visual design on the text bubble with shadow and pausing animation to enhance contrast and visibility. And for the showcase template, we added arrow animation on each touch point. The second suggestion we received is to reinforce the feedback after each selection. In the showcase template, we add text feedback to indicate a selection has been made. And for both showcase and polling templates, the reset effect will be played when the option bubbles are full. The third concern is that the layout and colors affect the precision of data visualization. So we presented different film layouts and art style to the client and made the artistic design decision after discussions. Our, our client expected us to use the appealing layouts to engage and inspire people to think about the topics in identities and cultures by reading through the content and answering the questions. The next problem is that the hygiene issue with touch interaction. The pandemic was unexpected for us and it's a common question on whether it will change all touch te technology. Our client assured us that they will be alert with this issue by either frequently cleaning the surface or attaching a hand sanitizer dispenser nearby. Since we use light sensors and have the sensibility threshold adjustable, it's possible to change direct touch to distant touch with testing in the real environment. Another concern is why we design templates without full freedom. We pitched a lot of mechanics to the client and decided on implementing these three templates to offer an easy start on utilizing our tool. The template-based system will provide a platform for future developers and designers with inspirations and potential for creating more templates and mechanics. The last concern is the association between VR and real-time installation is not strong enough. As Lou mentioned before, we considered the pros and cons before we carried on with VR. We understood that VR has limitations and hope to replicate the direct touch interaction with the spatial sense of the location. And next, Rushi will talk about our documentation. Thank you, Lingshan. As documentation is one of our main deliverables, we created a consolidated document for our interactive projection system. For the users, we have consolidated all the content ideas we could come up with and included them in our manual as a reference. Our product, however, is not only limited to these content prompts, hence the guidelines of creating some content can help users to keep expanding the scope, topic, and tone of the content created. For the admins, the manual contains the physical installation instructions for the system and steps on how to use the software. For the manual for designers and developers, the manual for designers is made to understand the design process from the starting of the semester, and the developer's manual documents the tech process on how to make changes and adjustments to the system we have delivered. Next, let's look at some of the lessons learned, first being flexibility. Being flexible and allowing a lot of options for our client will result in a dynamic product. Along with a modular approach to our development and design, we are delivering technical and design manuals to help us make our product flexible so that parts of the system can be updated in the future. Playtesting. We strive to conduct meaningful playtests all throughout the semester. After the spring break, we had to creatively problem solve for conducting playtests, and that is when we decided to use the power of virtual reality and simulate an environment for the kennel room. It helped us not only convey our ideas to the instructors, playtesters, and clients, but also aided the team by providing tangible feedback to our development process. Third is the purpose. The main aim of this project has always been to design something for the global languages and cultures room, to be able to find and convey the identity of this room. We also want the users to reflect and think about the topics presented and at the same time enjoy interacting with the system through visual interactions. Fourth is visualization. 
We as a team always strive to be able to show our design plans through infographics, animations, and 3D visualizations. This helped us convey to the client what the system would look like when installed. Fifth, implementation. Having a responsive development life cycle helped us mitigate concerns which could have come later in the project life cycle. And the last trade-off between cost, time, and option for the installation, and also the team's needs and what the client wanted. Finally, we plan to ship the film and sensors at our client's address by May 12th. Since we do not have access to the room anytime soon, we are not giving, we are not the ones installing it, but we have strived to make this process as easy as possible. We thank any, everyone who helped us make this project a success. We really appreciate it. Finally, we are the other side and we are building a choice-based interactive projection system. Thank you. And now we are open for questions. Good job team, yay. So Dave will help uh, moderate any Q&A. Go Dave. Mo, you wanna go? Yeah, sure. Uh, it seems like maybe you inadvertently came up with a really nice mechanism for data acquisition as in like actually pulling uh, a body for pertinent information, have you? looked into that or can you talk a little bit more about what you're going for in the experience of taking, uh, collecting this data? Did you hear the question properly? No, yeah, can you repeat the questions again? I only heard about like taking collections on the data. Yeah, it seems like there's a really good op opportunity here for data acquisition. Um, and that could be something as simple as polling, of, you know, the student body and what their interests are, or actually, you know, theoretically collecting enough data for, you know, machine lear learning purposes. So can you talk about a little bit about uh, what, you know, the choice of polling and what you're trying to accomplish? that user experience oh. a little bit more and how you might use it in future applications? Okay, um, so at this moment, uh, what we're first, we're trying to do is the reflective learning because there are many factors that will be affecting the, um, the data. For example, we cannot really stop one person to like um, repeatedly making the choice. So right now, the moment does what we're trying to do here is we put something about languages or cultures or something about identity. And when we when visitors come here and read about this, they can think about, it helps them, encourage them to think or reflect on certain topics. So right now we focus more on the t little takeaways rather than the data at the moment. And as far as, sorry, go ahead. Oh, oh so, uh, we are focusing more on the takeaway, but we keep it um, the flexibility because we understand that that would be a really good features to have in the future. So we keep it um, on our wiki and on our manual to let our client has the opportunity to implement those features in the future. And as far as the data collection goes, so there is a JSON file which, which gets created. Uh, from the front end, which has the number of votes for everything. That is always accessible to our client. I think uh, Mike has a question. Did, did you get your chance to have your client or any of your clients uh, people to test any of your templates? I think the template is really good for extensibility and for flexibility. Uh, it would have been nice to see if your documentation and tools are good enough for them to get going really quickly. Did you have a chance to test that at all? Um, we plan to have a session with the, with the client's class before, but um, because of the pandemic and in the end, we got canceled last just last week, but we reach out to the client and there's another professor also teaches at the Kenner room and both of them has um, went through our documentations on, especially on the content creation, on um, creating prompts, that if they can understand what these templates about and if they could under follow the prompts and really create something that um, can go on to the templates that we have um, checked with the client and another professor, Sebastian, and also we have asked our instructors to help us test if they can understand what's going on and literally try to create something.
Um, could I ask a question? Yes, please. Go ahead. I, don't, I don't know if it would be a good one, but um, because for the contact on the glass, um, do you guys think maybe um, like, do you guys think an infrared sensor or something? You know how like in bathrooms, you can sort of contact list just wave your hand in front of it. Do you think that might work? Although this is kind of not that helpful at this stage. Okay. Yeah, so uh, before the half, when we have the access to the room, we tested several fidget sensors because uh, client picked the fidget sensors. Uh, we test, uh, I think, the touch sensor, the IR reflective, and, uh, and the light sensor. And we figure out that the light sensor works like the best among all the sensors. That's why we log down to that one. All right. Um, but there's always possibility to implement different, just we have to test the exactly like of the, the light and the environment and also how the glass is affecting how we are receiving the signals. Yeah. Thank you. All right, great job team. Good job for the other side. If y'all can like mute yourself and turn off your cameras and now we'll get ready for theater.exe. Do we have everybody there? They ready to turn their cameras on and get ready to be the stars? Yes, we're here. All uh, right. I, I need permission to start my video. There's two of me, sorry. Two of you? Yeah, one of me has to share the slides. Okay, got it, try it now. I got it, I'm here, I think. Thank you very much. And I think everyone can see the slides. We're good. We're good. We go. Okay, we are theater.exe. This is our team. And these are our project advisors, Brenda and Chris. And here are our par project partners, experts in an immersive theater from the company Long Bodied Moose, Sam Turek and Gab Cody. We are a discovery project that looked into how do we give guests agency and get in a live in theater performance uh, by using technology and are deliverable for this semester. Are a taxonomy knowledge base prototype documentation and design concept documentation and these four things will be discussed today. Our last deliverable is an article for the well played journal that will be submitted by the end of this month. Now here to give a quick recap of the her first half of the semester, Tina. And uh, apologies, I thought the video problem was fixed, but I actually, the phone, uh, I still can't, I still can't start. Sorry. Could we, is there another me that needs to be given permission? All participants should be able to share at this point. Okay. I think I should be visible. There we go. Thanks so much. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So uh, as a recap for the for last semester, uh, bleh. as a recap for the first half of the semester, uh, we were trying to find different ways to give guest agency on live performance, and we started by making a knowledge base of existing live in-person experiences that kind of range from immersive theater to uh, role-playing games uh, that just give different types of agency or have different performance or game-like elements to them. Uh, that would help us um, see what came before. So now that we're online, since the beginning, we also had like a backup of a digital version of this information. And from our knowledge base, we created a taxonomy that has terms uh, and definitions that are important for our project to understand from the beginning. For example, we had to clarify for ourselves the difference between immersive and interactive theater. Uh, we decided that for us interactive theater meant that there was agency for the guests and agency is another definition that we had to clarify from the very beginning uh, for example uh, within the industry there's lots of um, different ways to use all these terms and even within our group uh, when in the beginning when we talked among ourselves about what agency meant to us uh, we had different ideas so we had to clarify that the kind of agency that we were going for with our project was that guests uh, can perceive that they are influencing the narrative or the story. So with this goal in mind, we created two prototypes before Habs uh, Snapshot and Emote Me. And we asked our project partners, Sam and Gab, 
uh, to give us feedback in general and also uh, to help us think of uh, stories or narratives that could make use of these prototypes. As for where the prototypes fall on our chart, we figured it was about there. And uh, it was it's kind of deliberate that these two prototypes kind of fall in different spaces because we did want to try different things. And of course, for each prototype, we also had some ideas that we did not go ahead with. Uh, nevertheless, the ideas and the tech uh, sort of ideas that we thought of for those ideas uh, become useful later on. So uh, halfway through the semester, we had a pivot, of course, to the COVID due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we decided from the very beginning, though, that we still wanted to continue study live and in-person performances uh, because it had been such an integral part of the goal of our project that we felt like to switch to online or recorded mediums kind of completely changes the nature of the project, which we didn't want to do. Uh, another thing was that uh, our project had been theory heavy and we were more interested in theory than practically building things uh, from the beginning anyway. So we thought it could be a kind of silver lining uh, that, uh, that the restrictions uh, kind of causes us to focus more on theory. And, uh, and then uh, finally, we felt that it was important to try to lead with the narrative. Uh, this was uh, from feedback from our first two prototypes. Uh, we felt that we wanted to avoid a situation where we came up with the technology and now we're trying to come up with a story to fit it. Uh, we wanted to start with the narrative more. So for the second half of our semester, uh, we worked more with, closely with our project partners, Sam and Gab, to try to apply agencies for guests to a specific narrative. And Sally will talk more about this, by the way. Uh, thank you, Tina. Uh, so as Tina mentioned, our pivot after house was a theoretical approach with a specific narrative. After speaking to Sam and Gab, they suggested we open a discussion on an impromptu test narrative, Little Red Riding Hood. We started off with answering how the story resonated with us. We came up with different themes that could inspire the story for this narrative, like bravery, stranger danger, and loss of innocence. This led to the second question, how these themes were similar to the technology in real world. We came up with technical aspects like hacking, dark web, deep fakes, and etc. So as we were brainstorming, we also thought of the kind of technology that we could use to actually support the Little Red Riding Hood story in theater. As you can see, our ideas were evolving to being very specific and interaction based, like spotlights, haptics, and NFC rings. Therefore, we chose to go ahead with the Little Red Riding Hood narrative because first, it had the context the participants could bring along with them, and second, it seemed to have a good potential to become a full design. Here is a high-level overview of our new pipeline with Sam and Gab. Adeline will further elaborate this in the later slides. As discussed, Sam and Gab would provide the Little Red Riding Hood narrative, which comprises of the story, the structure, and the interactions in the story. In this mutually iterated process, we as a team would come up with different agency moments, technologies that support this agency moments, and ultimately hope to have a full design that incorporates live performance, agency, and technology. Coming to our first agenda of finding agency moments, we went back to the ideation documentation for our previous prototypes that we had created before the pivot. After sifting through it, we identified some ideas having repetitive agency types and their technologies. Here are a few. Snapshot, our second prototype, focuses on individual agency moment for each of the guests. Each guest can have the freedom to have a personalized interaction. Emote Me, which is our first prototype, has collaborative agency, wherein all the guests work together to perform the same action. What's My Power Idea attempts to allow agency inspired by sorting of the guests into groups based on their personalities. And in Why You Look So Lonely Idea, the guests have the agency to convince the live performer to change or influence his actions. So now we had a good repository of agency types and technologies that we could possibly ad adapt to the Little Red Riding Hood narrative. So for the structure of the design, first, we thought of sorting of the guests into groups based on some characteristics. Second, we thought of adapting collaborative agency for the groups formed after this sorting. Here, each group could work towards a shared goal. Third, each guest in this group could have their own individual agency. And lastly, each group 
can perform actions that could influence the live performer. So with our agency types put together, we started piecing the narrative and actions iteratively with Sam and Gab to flesh out the Little Red Riding Hood narrative design experience, which will now be explained in detail by Adam. Thank you, Sally. So we did this design, Little Red Riding Hood Deliberation. It's an exploratory set of moments of tech and agency in live theater experience. And our goal is to serve creators as potential inspirations for combining technology and agency. Our partner provided us with a narrative sketch. It's a fictional truth and reconciliation experience. Guests are descendants of victims, perpetrators, advocators, and bystanders of an original historical event and are represented in the negotiation by the avatars from the Little Red Riding Hood story. The reason why we choose Little Red Riding Hood is also because uh, we are all familiar with the story, and it could be beneficial when guests can bring the narrative background they already know to the experience. This is the overall process of the whole experience. Uh, there are in total three phases, the sorting phase, deliberation phase, and judgment phase. And our focus is in the deliberation phase, which we will talk in details later. First, I will describe the sorting phase um, because it provides a basis for the deliberation phase. For the sorting phase, guests will go through a series of immersive encounters designed to divide them by their personality. And they are sorted into four different groups, the Little Red, Wolf, Grandmother, and Huntsman. Each group has defining characteristics that match both with the Little Red Riding Hood character, as well as the different members of the original historical event. After the sorting phase, guests will experience the training part where they are taught the mechanism of how to use their agency. After that is the deliberation phase. All guests are in the same room surrounding the four performer representatives having the roundtable discussion. And uh, the roundtable discussion is partially uh, scripted and guided by a fifth performer, a facilitator. Each group of guests influence their avatar, the live performer, in their different unique ways, which is our focus of the design process. And we use the Little Red Riding Hood group as an example to describe our design process for creating agency moments for each character. We got the character personalities and their possible actions from our partner. And we had a lot of brainstorms and design thinking about what kind of interactions will guests be doing? How could technology help achieve that? How could interaction influence the live performance? And how could that influence the narrative outcome? For further description, uh, here, here's one agency example that we designed for the Little Red Riding Hood group. Based on a narrative element that the Little Red Riding Hood is innocent, easy to be distracted, we use digital butterflies to symbolize the distracting thought that the Little Red Riding Hood had during the deliberation. The agency moment for the guests is that they can interact with the butterflies that projected on the ground to get rid of them. And the number of the butterflies in the scene will influence the live performance action. If the number of butterflies under the threshold, Little Red Riding Hood will keep focusing on the deliberation. If the number reached the threshold, the Little Red Riding Hood avatar will be distracted and wander around the room instead of focusing on the deliberation event. And that will cause narrative outcome in the following story. Implementation. An attack implementation could using a Kinect to detect the depth data in the area. And this is one agency moment that we create for the Little Riding Hood. Here's the sketch overview of all the agency designs for each group of guests. And their interactions are quite different, depends on different characteristics of the avatar. And next, Halsey will talk about our conclusions. Thank you, Adeline. As we uh, draw our presentations to a close, there are a few things we want to talk about. First, we really want to share what we took away from this past semester. Our biggest takeaway is that although we could not prove it directly, we do believe that it's possible for an in-person live performance to have agency that can influence the narrative. There are just a lot of parameters to take into consideration before it can be justified. Obvious parameters being time and money, but the most crucial one being testing. Without playtesting, our designs remain a theory. Our second lesson, we now know how important a narrative can serve for a meaningful experience. Without a narrative, it can be very difficult to create a meaningful act of agency. 
And another notable point we wanted to highlight was that live in-person performance have unique kinds of goals and challenges. We went into the project and experience when it came for designing for theater. Uh, we actually went into the project having a game design mindset. And we learned very quickly that there were two different types of designs. For example, um, something that was very noticeable was the role of the audience and their goals. For games, players typically have a role of a protagonist and they are given a very clear goal. However, for theater, there is only so much of agency that we can give to a person with a role before the immersive show can become a live in-person game. We also don't know if theater guests actually want agency in a performance to begin with. And it was a really fun challenge to work around. And this was just something we wanted to share with future ETC students looking into design. Going forward, we are wrapping up our article with, for the Well Played Journal, and we will be handing that in by the end of this month. And we do know that a lot of our presentation focused on our process. However, our final design is something we can't share in a 15 minute time span, but it's still something we would love to share. So if you could come visit us during final playthroughs or just message us um, before the semester's over, we would be happy to go over our designs with you. And with that, we are theater.exe. We are a discovery project that looked into how do we give guest agency in a live in-person performance by using technology. And now we are open for questions. So if, if I can jump in, I have a question. Um, the, uh, going back to your initial layout where you were designing the phases, um, my, did you take a look at, there's a game called, uh, for example, Two Rooms and a Boom, which seems to follow pretty much the, the same phases as you designed where you're sorted into different groups, you're given different roles, you have different goals uh, to accomplish and seems to follow a lot of the same designs. So I was just wondering if you were familiar with that or if you had any experience on how that works versus how what you've designed works because I don't have all the details of what you designed. Uh, you said it was two rooms and a broom? I can sort of answer that, which is I think that sounds familiar, but we kind of thought of this separately. So the question was if we looked at two rooms and a and a and a and a broom. Like I feel like that sounds familiar, but yeah. We kind of just separately came up with this for just kind of, I think, coincidentally. Oh, okay. Yeah. Great question. Skip to the slide where we were talking. Uh, I guess I'll ask a question. Um... I'm kind of curious, in your pivot, it seems like one of the big changes was you moved from the ability to sort of build and, and test to sort of design and get feedback. I'm just yes. curious how, um, how that process felt, especially being ETC students and being used to building things and testing and what the process, um, what sort of like you saw as added benefits or different benefits of the, the whole feedback loop you were working with. Uh. I can repeat the question. The question was, um, how, how do we feel about pivoting towards uh, more theory and less practical, build, practically building stuff? Yeah. I can give you my perspective from that. Uh, I think this semester has been one of my most challenging semesters because uh, we couldn't just play test and make a decision from there based off of the, what we get for, for feedback. Uh, instead, we would have to go on theories and think of the most logical approach and ask our project partners what they believe would happen in that situation. And not being able to prove it for me was pretty frustrating. But I think that this semester gave us so much more creativity in developing things for technology, uh, things that we haven't even thought of. We have a whole list of ideas that I was super excited about to go through. And in the end, when we had to kind of chisel it down to make it doable or believable or something that could be built in the future or the near future, uh, it kind of took away from the creativity. But that moment to be able to have all of the creativity I wanted was really, really fun. I'd like to second that. That um, the bright side was that it emphasized a phase of working on stuff that 
um, I think like I often just kind of like try to get past as fast as possible so like we can start building stuff. But actually the kind of conceptual phase is actually really interesting. And it was really nice to spend time on that. Uh, I agree as well. Uh, I think in my perspective, uh, when we were actually building prototypes, uh, the thought of implementing a technology was a little restrictive owing to how, on what kind of technology we could get our hands on. But when yeah. we shifted to theory, uh, we could think out of the box since we did not uh, have to design it, but uh, just uh, build a design around it. So it helped to expand creativity in terms of that. Time for one more question. All right, thank you, team. Good We're job, Theater.exe. Do we have oh, time for who had a question? Jesse, you want to go ahead? Yeah, we do. Uh, yeah, sorry, I was struggling with these interfaces here. Um, it, so I see what you guys are describing, and you guys have explored so many things this semester. If there's one thing that, it, like, if you could build a show tomorrow, um, like what would you see as kind of the core technology that would make an interactive show better based on everything that you've looked at? Uh, I can repeat the question. Like what is the most like core and important technology that we think is needed for an interactive show? Um. I can offer my opinion on that. <laughs> uh, for me, I believe that no matter what technology we came up with, there was always a fun way to use it. As long as there was, there is a way to use that technology to give guests at least a very small amount of agency. For me, it's always satisfying, but because it's, it's different for each guest based off of what they want, uh, I can't really say what would be super successful. Uh, did that answer your question? Uh, not exactly, but it, but it sounds like you guys are where you are. So I, uh, I get it. Yeah, I kind of like to second that. I don't think we found a magical uh, tech that like, it will instantly kind of, if we have this, it will jazz up. Um, I can think of maybe like, there seems to be this motif of like, um, how do we, make sure that um, if we cue, if the audience does something, how does the performer also know that it's happening and that like everybody's cued at the same time? But I don't know, that's, that feels like it's kind of like infrastructure for like how, how, like, I don't know if it's like directly responsible for giving guests more agency. So far, what we've got is more like, um, depending on what, what story we're trying to do, make it for, we can seem to just put anything in it. Got and it. Makes sense. It might not work. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Thanks, team. Great job. Good job. Yay. So good job, theater.exe. And if you all don't mind muting and taking off your cameras. And now I'll let um career 2040 come up. Y'all there? Y'all there? Hello? Here they come. Uh, hello, everyone. All right. Can you uh, see my screen? Yep. Yes. Cool. So, good afternoon, everyone. We are the team Career 2040. We are a team of four people. Charlie and Samia are the programmers. Yue is the designer, and I'm the producer of my team. Our fact advisor is Scott Stones. Our clients are Dr. Kimball Lovelace, Jason Swenson, and Annie Martinez. So this project was originally designed and developed for several conferences like South by Southwest EDU and Remake Learning Base Pittsburgh. Although some of them are canceled or postponed, Career 2040 will still be shown at future events. So first, I'm going to introduce our project. What is Career 2040? Career 2040 is a project aiming at providing an immersive AR experience that simulates in the interview and hiring practices in 2040. So we have three keywords, AR, 
algorithm monitoring and 2014. It's a part of AHC, which will highlight the biases in the workforce. So again, what is AHC? AHC means Algorithm Hiring Center, which is a three-stage experience. At first, the guests are waiting at the holding lounge, as well as watching some materials about bias in the workforce. They then go through our AR experience, and finally, they are asked to provide some feedback as the whole experience and watch more materials to build awareness. So our work will focus on the second part. So just to clarify, the goal of the whole project AHC is to get people curious about bias in the workforce. However, our goal is to simulate the algorithm hiring process. There are some additional requirements from our clients, like why we're choosing 2040 or why we're choosing AR. The reason is that we want to give it a futuristic theme to attract more people at those conferences. Now, I'll continue to talk a little bit more about our experience design. Here's our design flow. At first, the guest enters into the room. They will see the introduction and guidance of the whole experience. After that, they will look at basic information of the money. And then the guest will be the role of the evaluator to watch the whole interview process that how to match the job options with her personal experience. After the interview process, they will show the job list matched with the persona. The guests are allowed to tweak the algorithm. And finally, after the guest finished changing the algorithm, the job options will also change accordingly. Now, Sama is going to introduce our demo. <clears throat> Thank you, William. So, uh, I wanted to ask, can everyone hear the sound? Yes. OK, uh, thanks. Wait, uh, I'm not sure. Welcome to the Algorithmic Hiring Center, where you're dedicated to matching you with meaningful work. This center. It's on and off. I think the sound is off when you are muted. Anya's interview process and the algorithm will choose a career for her. Uploading data from users likewise. Mommy is searching for people. CA. She has always dreamed of being a nurse practitioner, just like her mother. She enjoys learning about science in her after school STEM club. She enjoys hanging out with her friends and was voted most likely to become president in last year's seventh grade yearbook. potential job options for money. Okay, so what AHC is doing over here is that it's downloading uh, personas data and it analyzes and all the yellow boxes that you're seeing right now on the screen are personas dream job options. In order to determine the best match for work, Amani will be asked a few questions. According to her answers, these options will be filtered. Permission for the algorithmic hiring center to access your biometric data. This will help us to make a better match for you. Yes, here we go again. Of course, you want to. <sighs> So what happened over there was that uh, AHC analyzed the way Persona answered the question and uh, it filtered few options from there. Amani, the clock is ticking for an important assignment at school that is due. How do you feel? That would 
really stress me out, but I have to really work hard to get it done. Amani, one of your friends in your lab group comes to you. They are confused about an assignment, which has caused them to fall behind. What do you do? That would really stress me out, but I have to really work hard to get it done. Amani, do you have any new certifications, credits, micro-credentials projects, or other relevant learning experiences you would like to upload that were not captured in your life log? get all of these extra credentials. I can't really afford any more by the deadline. It was way the moment as we update the mind is earning this profile and locate the jobs, project and tasks that are the best fit for her. As mentioned before, the persona is asked a few questions and based on how they answer uh, the AHC tweaks, uh, I mean, AHC filters all the job options and later on the user has to tweak the algorithm so that the AHC can re-evaluate uh, all the job options. Evaluator number 143, we have permissions to tweak the AHC hiring algorithm. We will need to both give our security clearance. Do you want to tweak the AHC to change the result of a minus job matching? Press the trigger to grab the word bubble and drop it into the algorithm to tweak AHC. Thank you for the adjustments. Evaluator number 143. Matching can be a delicate job and this one we take seriously. The algorithms used in and the algorithmic hiring center will always need to be tweaked to help ensure the best match and overcome by especially some of the most marginalized among us. In order to help us continue to make the best matches we can, you will be asked for more input into issues facing those seeking to be hired, especially for marginalized girls. So as you saw, the, uh, the way tweaking works is that you have to drop like word bubbles in the algorithm and uh, based on what, what word bubbles are dropped, uh, AHC reevaluates all the job options. And now if you ever talk about design exploration. Thank you, Samia. I will continue to talk about our design principle. So our goal is designing a futuristic interface that is actually functioning with a real product. The basic workflow is trying to figure out what the story is trying to see. For our project, the story happened in 2040. High tech, futuristic, and powerful should be our key point. They are perceived as hyper intelligent and powerful. Navigating a com complex UI and synthesize a large am amount of data. Since have presentations, soft opening faculty and client meeting, we received a lot of useful feedback. The first issue is readability. Our typography hierarchy was kind of confusing as all the info looks equally important. This is the last version of UI design. As you can see, the overall design is flat. There is no strong contrast in the whole composition. Every screen we enlarge our title, Algorithm Hiring Center, at the top, and we should be clearly shown for the button interaction, and the button should be um, popped out. And this is the last version of UI design. Um, this is the final version. And then uh, we make the title bit highlight and make the gold color now, the, now use the same light blue and it will be stand out better. And also we made our bottom button in color and try gold and keep the consistency of UI so the buttons are always in the same space. So the guest won't be lost in the whole experience. Here's the previous detailed information analysis page. That was a pretty sensitive image, so we changed the full body heat map 
to a young adult poetry. Also, we added an animation called Stress Response to show her emotional status below and among this profile. Our second issue is lack of using 3D space. AR overlays digital content and information onto the physical world. We want to provide a space that's actually there with our guests in their own immersive content of their real world. So we added a robot to represent the algorithm and the table to match the physical room to give our guests the sense of futuristic interview process. As the sign for the guidelines to get our guests to learn how to interact with this AR experience. The third issue is on confusion of guest role. We added another robot sound and a model to make it clear. Through the combination of visual and the sound effect, we added a personal pronoun before each sentence. For instance, um, a money or evaluator, in order to ensure that the guests always in, know their role. Um, Charlie will introduce our sound effect. Thanks, Yue. Uh, so first, uh, we are using Google Translate Voice for the voice of the algorithm, and here is a short demo. Hiring center. We are dedicated to matching you with meaningful work. And we record real young woman sound for the voice uh, for the sound of young young lady personas, and we also add some futuristic sound effects to adapt to the 2040 theme. <laughs> and finally, we make use of 3D sound effect to direct users' attention. And next, I will talk about the programming part. Uh, first is framework. Uh, Career 2040 is built upon a custom framework. So why do we need a framework? The first thing is reusability. There are some features that can be reused in our project. And the framework can provide us a high code reusability. Another thing is efficiency. Since our project is a sequential experience, it could be easier for us to add, modify, or delete content and it also provides a better debugging. <laughs> Next is UI Manager. Uh, it is used as a bridge to connect the controller and the UI elements. The Magic Leap SDK provides a way to detect the position and input of the controller. And we use recasting to enable the guests to interact with our experience. For example, to zoom in, zoom out, or to proceed to the next page. And for better interact with the physical world, we make use of these three features from Magic Leap SDK. We, make, we use image tracking to generate virtual objects and attach it to some real objects in the physical world. And we use the world reconstruction to simulate a calibration effect. And we also use hand tracking to involve more interaction. So in summary, we are Team Career 2040 and we are creating an AR immersive experience that simulates hiring and interviewing process in the year 2040. And finally, we want to say thank you to those who have helped us. We really appreciate your help. And that's it for our presentation and we are open for questions now. Good job, team. Yay. So Dave's going to help with uh, Q&A. Jesse, go ahead. Does the uh, client have plans to make use of this in the future, do you think? Uh, so the question is, does the client have a plan to make use of uh, this in the future? So yeah, I think I think they have, and they are requiring some design documents and how to implement this, some documents about this too. So. Okay, thanks. Um, so this is John Balash. I can add to that comment. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Um, so the history of the project went from um, the local Thrival Festival to ISTE uh, last year, which is the International Society for Technology Educators. 
um, and then was accepted to South by Southwest this year um, and was also going to be hosted at the, um, the Remake Learning Days conference. Um, so yeah, it has a, a track record of uh, touring different conferences and events. And then, uh, yes, so we would use the, the product and those experiences. Great, thanks. I've got a question. Uh, so with the shift remote, were you guys able to find ways to iterate the experience for like player experience and like get insight into how the player understood different implementations and how they were able to understand the whole experience? So the question is um, the iteration process of how to help the guest understand the experience. Is that right? Yeah, basically, especially post uh, going remote. Uh, sure, so I can offer my opinion. So from the first, it seems it's not very understandable for the guest. So we make a lot of changes to help the guest to understand it like we add another robot, add another sound, so that the guest will know the one robot is for a money and the other one is for introducing this, this project. And yeah, we also changed the script. Like uh, at first, it's not very clear whether the robot is asking a money or asking the evaluator. So now we have something like a money, you blah, 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 or evaluator, you blah, blah, blah. So now it's pretty clear. And Tim, do you have anything else to say? Oh, I just want to add like uh, the working remote really caused some trouble to us because like we are using Magic Leap and it's hard for us to yes. share our product. But so we just uh, share some digital stuff like video or the image to to our client, like to per, let them provide us some feedback. Thanks. Time for one more. All right, thanks team, good job. Job career 2040. So if you all can mute yourselves, turn your cameras off, and we can uh, get CoVR up here. Do we have CoVR in the room? In the Zoom room? We are here. There he is. And of course, he has a good mic. Sorry. I have to say is everyone else ready? Yes. Yep. All right. Here. We go. Hello, everyone. We are Team Co VR, and we are a discovery project exploring social experiences in VR. This is our team, and this is our faculty, Ricardo and Ruth. And our client are Ajay from Oculus Facebook. So, right now in the market, there is not enough adoption of VR headsets, nor enough experiences which allow VR players to play with their families or friends together. To solve this problem, our client comes up with a solution, which is tap into the mobile device market to let VR players